Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon, and this week we're taking a look at some of the technology used in agriculture. Even some of the technology that changes our perspective a little bit. We'll have more on UAVs later in the show. But first, we're starting with spray nozzles and the science behind them. SunUp's Curtis Hare caught up with Extension Ag Engineer, John Long. We're here with our Extension Ag Engineer, John Long, talking sprayer nozzles. And John, you kind of have a, a little system set up here. Uh, kind of give us a little overview of what you have going on. Yeah, sure. So what I've got here is a, what we call our spray table. It's basically just a, a, a setup that's designed that I can take to different events, uh, a lot of meetings across the state as far as uh, both uh, youth and uh, producers. And just gives us a way to demonstrate what happens in an in a agricultural spray a rig as far as being able to recirculate water and look at different nozzle types, show different things like where and, and that kind of thing. So is this one uh, an older or newer model than this one? How are these two different? So I've got a couple different ones here, but the ones I have selected here, this is just a uh, uh, extended range flat fan nozzle that's uh, kind of a, a I guess the technology has been out for many years. Uh, these used to come in brass and stainless. You can still get them in those materials now, but a lot of them come in plastic and, and metal inserts. And it's just a flat fan nozzle used a lot for a lot of different broadcast applications and that kind of thing. Uh, the one I have on the right here that's selected is an air induction style tip. This is, happens to be a, a two-piece uh, tip, but it basically draws air into the system, mixes air with the water, and creates uh, much larger droplets than the, uh, the small tips at the same flow rates. So when you're applying these out in the field, like what, what type of situation would you be using these for? Where would they come into play? So both of these are flat fan nozzles. They would be used on a broadcast uh, application sprayer. Uh, so you would have them on a boom spacing just like I have here. Um, the original flat fan here, extended range, those can be used for a lot of broadcast applications, uh, but they're really good for where you need a lot of coverage because they produce a lot of smaller droplets, uh, especially at higher pressures. Whereas the, the air induction style nozzles are used in areas where we want larger droplets and uh, they're going to be used a lot of times in places where we're applying herbicides, especially systemic herbicides like Roundup and those types of things. Can we actually turn it on to see kind of what the difference sure. is? Sure. Yeah. So we've got uh, the two nozzles here, they're set up, and if you can take a look here just from the visual standpoint, you can see that there's much finer uh, nozzles or droplets coming off this nozzle versus our air induction. You can also really kind of hear the air induction a little bit, drawing that air in and mixing it. Um, if we look at the, the nozzle itself, there's a lot of fines coming off of this particular one. And if I increase the pressure a little bit, so we're running at 40 PSI. If I increase the pressure just a little bit more, we get even more fines kind of rolling off of this one. So that's one of the issues we have with these nozzles. They provide a lot of fines for good coverage, but we get a lot of those that could be uh, driftable. So why the change between the two? Like what, what brought that about? So there's been a lot of changes in, in industry, industry over time as new technology new materials come out, but uh, drift is a big thing that I already kind of hit it on there is that you know that's one of our concerns we want to make sure that we're applying our herbicides our insecticides where we want them to go uh, it's been a big thing in the news lately in the past couple of years especially but we want to make sure we're using our uh, resources wisely we're getting good effective uh, kills on the pests that we're trying to control and also we're able to uh, not damage our neighbors and, and cause other issues from drift coming through all right thanks john and if you would like any more information on that, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Dry soils have become the norm in more and more areas of Oklahoma. A map of the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches highlights the widespread areas of low soil moisture. The shock on this map is how low the brown area values are in the teens or below 10% of plant available water at many Mesonet locations. 
Fractional Water Index gives us point measure of soil moisture. At the 24-inch depth, there is a dramatic split between the green areas that are above six-tenths and the dry areas that are two-tenths or lower. A fractional water index of one is the wettest a soil can be, zero is the driest it can be. Today is my last Mesonet weather report. It has been an honor and a pleasure to bring you information about Oklahoma's weather through these TV segments over the past 10 years. I hope you have gained a better understanding of our weather and how Mesonet data and products can help you make the most of each day. I wish you and your family the best in the days and years ahead. Now here's Gary with a check on droughts increasing intensity. Thanks Alan, good morning everyone. Let me start off by saying what a pleasure it's been to work with Al Sutherland and over the years on the Mesonet Weather Report. 255 shows dating all the way back to the spring of 2009. Now I'm going to clue you on a little secret. I'm definitely willing to admit, and I'm sure we all can, that Al was the brains of this non-dynamic duo. And he was also the better looking. Now speaking of truly ugly though, let's go straight to the new drought monitor report. We are seeing that uh, severe and extreme drought, the, the darker browns and the, the red starting to spread over more parts of the state. Northeast Oklahoma now have a pretty big blob of extreme drought uh, surrounded by severe drought. Also starting down in southeast Oklahoma, those are new areas of extreme drought. Uh, the area of uh, severe drought is also expanded, that's the darker brown. And the light tan, which is moderate drought, that's also starting to grow, get uh, larger and larger as that whole of a uh, non-drought area in the central part of the state starts to shrink a little bit. And we still have that area up in northwest Oklahoma that's also not in drought or abnormally dry, uh, but it can't last long unless they start to get rainfall in the face of all this heat we've recently had. Now speaking of rainfall, the last 30 days, that looks like a typical summertime pattern in Oklahoma. Some folks have had three to four inches, other people have had less than a, a quarter of an inch. Again, that's typical for summer in Oklahoma. Now if we look at that as a percentage of normal rainfall over the last 30 days, that shows up pretty well. Those red and orange areas, those are folks that are in danger from the flash drought situation we're currently seeing. So they are definitely the folks that are most in danger of seeing that flash drought continue to intensify. So as we leave July and enter August, it would be nice to get more rainfall to prevent further spread of that flash drought that we're currently seeing. That's it for this time, and we'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. The old saying of up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, actually it's a UAV. And Brian, the UAVs are used for agriculture purposes also. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity using UAVs, UASs, drones, and agricultural production today mm -hmm. to go scout. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that we get a different view of a field when you get up high. Mm -hmm. And especially if you look at the corn behind us here, it really gives you a sense of how getting above a crop could really help you see what's in it. Because you can't see more than four or five foot into this crop. So if you had a quarter section of corn that's at this point and you wanted to go look for a problem, let's say you have irrigation, you want to see that, getting up above it is a lot easier. And so the probably most applicable use for drones right now in, in cropping systems is a quick scout. Because getting that bird's eye view, knowing does everything look okay, if it doesn't, I need to go here and actually have that spot pinpointed. You might not necessarily be able to tell what it is, mm -hmm. but you go to it. So, so up there we're looking at maybe 60, 70 foot of altitude there. What, what can a producer do a quick scout with at 60 or 70 feet? That, that right there is not necessarily a scouting altitude. If right. you're looking at a full field, you're going to get up to about 400 feet. You're going to get near three, 400 foot, which is the maximum altitude right. allowed by FAA. So you get to that and you could see um, with the pan up, mm -hmm. you can see majority of a quarter section, mm -hmm. but you still fly out into it. Most of these drones will have a range from a quarter mile to a mile, depending on what you have. So you could easily get over a quarter section and look at it mm -hmm. uh, under one battery life and some of the newer drones with longer life, battery life mm -hmm. and more distance capability could see a full mile section worth of ground from up above. When when you're scouting, do you scout for for 
can you see insect pressure? Are we looking for more nutrients? Are we looking for more irrigation usage? So, so what you're really doing with a drone like this is looking for differences in the plants. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. You won't know what's causing it. Mm -hmm. So you could potentially fly down and get really close and zoom in and see is it an insect, is it a drought. Uh, sometimes you get close enough to tell what it is. Like in this field we have a couple red ant mounds. Mm -hmm. So from from the air you just see there's a dead spot. Right. You can get close enough, you can tell it's an ant mound and the harvester ants have gone in there and killed it. Uh, but in other spots, you might not know if it's a nutrient, if it's a pest or disease. You just know that something's going on there. That's why I say with the drone, it doesn't take the boots away from the ground right. because you still got to go out there and use agronomic uh, evaluation to find out what the problem is. So really, this is changing the perspective, allowing producers to, to use their, their, well, their farm experience mm -hmm. more, more profitably. Yep. More profitably, it allows uh, agronomic scouts to be more efficient. It allows farmers who are scouting themselves to be more efficient. For me, it's all about the efficiencies. There can be efficiencies builds if you're one of those uh, producers who go out and look at your fields regularly. This can, can add efficiency. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. And for more information on UAVs, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. The USDA recently released a lot of uh, reports, including the July cattle report. And Daryl, did that report tell us anything about herd expansion? You know, this this gives us a little bit of a longer term view of where we are with the uh, you know the overall inventory of cattle. So uh, the cattle inventory as of July one, the all cattle inventory was up one percent. Uh, if we focus on the cow herd, uh, the beef cow herd was up about nine tenths of one percent. Um, dairy uh, cow herd and dairy replacement heifers were unchanged from a year ago, but the beef replacement heifers were down about 2%. So what this suggests is that we do have more cattle in 2018. That's not really a surprise. Uh, we're probably seeing some, some modest additional herd expansion here in 2018. Uh, but it also suggests that we may be reaching a peak here and we could see these numbers stabilize uh, at some sort of cyclical peak as we go into 2019. So going into 2019, does this change your expectations regarding beef production at all? Not too much. I mean, uh, for, the, for the near term, uh, the feeder supplies that we calculate from this July inventory report are up about a half a percent. The calf crop estimate was up about 2 percent, which means that we're going to have ample feeder supplies not only for the rest of this year but into next year. And again, with the beef cow herd at least as big, probably a little bit bigger uh, for 2018, that means a, an even slightly bigger calf crop in 2019. So we're going to continue to see plenty of cattle uh, through 2019 on into 2020. Among the, those several reports was the monthly cattle on feed report. Was there any big surprises in there at all? You know, this report actually was very well anticipated. Uh, uh, placements and marketings were both up about 1%. Now, there was a fairly wide range of estimates on placements, so maybe some individual analysts were surprised a little bit, but on average, the report was very well anticipated. The July 1 on-feed inventory was up 4%, uh, 4.3, uh, I think, and that's a continuation, really, of what we've seen. We've maintained a pretty uh, constant 4% uh, year-over-year increase for the last several months in these cattle on-feed inventories. So what does all this mean for uh, producers going into the second half of the year and then going, in, going forward into 2019? Well, you know, I think uh, we, we expect to see, you know, probably some seasonal price pressure as we go into the second half of 2018. First half of the year, feeder cattle prices actually averaged at or slightly above year-go levels. Um, and so, you know, we'll probably see some seasonal pressure, but the key is, as always, is going to be demand. Demand has helped us for 18 months in the cattle and beef industry. As long as that continues, then we don't look for a lot of pressure. That'll probably be true even though we'll see a slight increase in production again in 2019. Uh, we're looking at only modest price pressure as long as the demand is there to absorb that additional supply. So what are some factors that producers should, you know, be watching or be considering, you know, going forward? You know, obviously we look at all the fundamentals. Uh, the supply side fundamentals, I think, are pretty well in place. Uh, Probably the only thing we're watching is carcass weights to see just how much they increase seasonally here towards the end of the year. But really it's the demand side and, and that demand side is going to be determined by this, this very turbulent global environment that we find ourselves in right now. Uh, lots of uh, you know, trade uh, issues, lots of policy issues out there. Uh, those can have a multitude of different uh, direct and indirect impacts that could affect the beef demand. So I think that's what producers are probably watching. Uh, we hope to see a little bit of clarity going forward at some 
standpoint uh, in terms of how this stuff might play out over the next several months. All righty, Daryl. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist at Oklahoma State University. Most places in Oklahoma this summer have had enough rainfall in order to uh, grow quite a little bit of standing forage and in the form of native grasses, or Bermuda grass, uh, that will help us as we go through the, the last half of summer and into the fall. Now we know that those grasses are going to be maturing and with uh, hotter days and drier days, the quality of that forage will decline as well. But we can use a nutritional principle to really help the cattle better use that declining uh, quality of forage. And the principle we're talking about is called positive associative effect. What do I mean by those big words? Well, that's the utilization of a small package of protein supplement that helps the bugs in the rumen of these cattle to grow and to be able to digest that lower quality forage. As long as those bugs in the rumen have adequate protein, they can multiply and do a good job of helping that particular animal utilize more of that forage and to utilize it better. Take a look at uh, this particular graphic that gives you an illustration of what happens when some cattle were fed just one and three quarters pounds of cottonseed meal while consuming some low quality forage. In this case, the forage was less than 5% crude protein. By feeding that small amount of protein supplement, the retention time, the time that that forage was in the rumen and in the stomach of, of the cattle involved was greatly reduced by about 32 percent. That of course meant that the, the cattle could then get hungry again, go back out and consume more forage than if the uh, forage stayed in the rumen and took a long time to be utilized by the animal. And uh, because of that then we see that the amount of forage being consumed voluntarily by these cattle that get that small amount of protein supplement is increased by 27, 28 percent. That means that they're not only getting more protein, they're getting more energy and more energy out of the hay that they're consuming and therefore they perform a little bit better. So that's the uh, concept of positive associative effect using just a little bit of protein to help these cattle better digest the lower quality forages that they'll have available to them as we go into late summer and early fall. So if you have some replacement heifers, perhaps some stocker cattle, that's a concept that can really be helpful to you with a relatively small amount of dollars invested to get considerably more use out of the forage that's available to those cattle this summer. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. For once, there's some good news in the wheat markets, and Kim, that news has to do with the price of wheat. Well, if you look at the uh, current price, it's back up to uh, around $5.50 in uh, some places in Oklahoma. I think it got up to around five sixty dollars early in the, in the harvest, so we're back up to those price levels, and I think that's good news. What's, what's driving that, that, that it, would you call it a price rally? Yeah, of course it's a price rally. We've had about a 75 cent uh, increase over the last two weeks, and I think the reason for that increase is what's going on in the former Soviet Union and uh, European Union. Uh, they, they continue to lower the, the European Union soft red winter wheat crop. You, you look at soft red winter wheat prices, Chicago border the CBT contract versus the KC contract, they're about even, so that spreads went away because of the EU's lower production. But the big news is Ukraine and Russia's production uh, estimates are continuing to go down. There was reports this week of uh, sprout damage in a, in a lot of wheat in, the, in Russia. So you got lower quality than last year. You've got a report of less harvested acres or lower harvested acres. You've got report of lower yields, voila, lower production. There, there's, uh, they're talking maybe down around uh, 2.4, 2.5 billion bushels rather than 3.1 last year. A year ago at this time, 
Egypt was kind of a player in all of that. Is, is Egypt in it this year? Oh yeah, Egypt uh, just uh, tendered for some wheat. Uh, reports are that they're going to pay about uh, $6 a bushel. Uh, FOB at the Black Sea port. This time last year they were paying about $4.90. You know, so you're looking at a dollar and ten cent higher wheat prices right now than we had this same time last year. Now, speaking of things in the news, there's there's been some 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 discussion about twelve billion dollars of, of of money going into agriculture. Is that going to play into the markets anyway? I can't see it playing into the market price because our corn's already in the in the in the fields. You know, it's already been fertilized. The soybeans are planted. Our wheat's harvested. Our spring wheat's already already down. So, you know, supply and demand situation is it's no impact. However, it could make the farm as a whole more profitable. Uh, if you look what's going on, I think that the uh, administration's trying to compensate producers for their loss because they're the pawn in this Chinese-American uh, trade war, which is not about agriculture products. It's about durable goods, autos, technology, that sort of thing. But ag's the pawn in, in China. You know, they, they announced that uh, their buyers, if that product goes into the uh, state stores, they'll, they'll compensate them for the tariff cost. And uh, Trump comes back or the administration comes back and says, well, we're going to compensate our, our farmers for their loss too. So it's a tit for tat war going on here on the trade side, ags the pawn, and uh, the two governments are trying to take care of them. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Let's talk spice. When was the last time you cleaned out your spice cabinet? Old spices won't make you sick, but they will give you some bland food. Spices and herbs can last different lengths of time. Ground spices, like nutmeg and cinnamon, last two to three years. Herbs, like basil, oregano, and parsley, last one to three. Seasoning blends last one to two years. Whole spices, like cloves, Peppercorns, cinnamon sticks last four years. Seeds, four years, with the exception of poppy seeds and sesame seeds, which should be discarded after two. Extracts usually last four years, with the exception of vanilla, which will last forever. If you don't know how long the spices have been in your cabinet and the container does not have a Best Buy date, then bring your senses into action. Look for bright, vibrant colors, Faded hues equal faded flavor. Aromas, rub the spices in your hand. If the aroma is a weak, it's time to toss. Taste the spice or the herb. If the product is lacking in flavor, then it's past its prime. If the product lacks in any flavor, color, or aroma, then it needs to be thrown away. Storing your spices and herbs away from heat, light, and moisture can help extend the life of the product. If you're going to store your herbs and spices out on the counter, then they must be stored in airtight and dark containers, as light will fade the color and heat and air will decrease the flavor profile of the spice. Keep your meals full of flavor with spices that are up to date. To learn more about FAPC, visit our website at fapc.biz and download our app or sun up at okstate.edu. It just wouldn't be summer in Oklahoma if we weren't fighting off flies and ticks and even mosquitoes. But there's some mammals out there that are causing homeowners some headaches too. Oklahoma State University Extension Wildlife Specialist Dwayne Elmore has some advice for managing what many of us call varmints. So often people want to attract wildlife around their home, uh, but there are some wildlife species that commonly cause damage. One of those that we get a lot of calls about is armadillo and we particularly hear co complaints during the summer months when people are irrigating and the armadillos are mostly feeding on grubs and, and uh, other insects in the soil so when people are, are watering especially during the time of the year when a lot of uh, the prairie and the forest uh, is very dry then the armadillos are often attracted to the home landscapes and so they'll, they'll dig and uh, tear up turf and this can be unsightly and it, and it can kill turf at times. So if you're having problems with armadillo, um, sometimes reducing irrigation can help, but if you need to irrigate an area, um, armadillos can be trapped and you don't need to bait a trap for this. We generally just try to funnel them. 
Um, we use large live catch traps, yeah. uh, about 12 inch openings and long funnels. And hits the wishbone triggers and as he gets close and hits those triggers, the door drops behind him like that and he's captured. Most of my work is in town where I'm dealing with uh, houses around town where we've got animals that are living, moved in under the houses. We've got a lot of wildlife all over the town uh, from foxes and raccoons, skunks. Another animal that often does turf damage is skunk, uh, specifically striped skunk. And similar to armadillos, they dig. Usually it's not as damaging as an armadillo. The, the digs are usually uh, smaller. They can also be trapped, use a smaller trap, one with about a six or seven inch opening. And for skunks, you do need to bait. And I would recommend either sardine or tuna or, or something like that usually will attract a skunk. So if you do happen to catch a skunk, uh, be careful not to come into contact with the animal. Uh, like many mammals, they, they can uh, carry rabies. So you know, don't allow that animal to potentially bite you or get any sal saliva on your skin. Uh, also, you know, they spray. So, and, that, and it's really hard to deal with the skunk in a trap without getting sprayed, frankly. So there's some other animals that we often get calls about. Raccoons and opossums are sometimes problems. And typically with both of those animals, they're either getting into garbage or they're eating pets food. And those are really easy to deal with and rarely do you need to trap. Um, if they're getting into garbage, use metal cans or really heavy duty plastic and secure the lid with a, a strong sturdy uh, strap. If they're getting into pet's food, just try to only put as much food out as the, the pet will consume at a time and not leave food out all the time, particularly don't leave it out at night. Well, that does it for us this week on SunUp. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From a research plot near Lake Carl Blackwell, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SunUp.